Thank you all for taking your time to come to hear about the CHOP tank and what is being done in this marvelous watershed and all the people involved that are doing it, including yourself, because I'm assuming most of you are probably uh, from this watershed, live in this watershed, and if not, you're here so you must have a heart for this watershed. My name is Sarah Taylor Rogers. I'm the assistant director of the Harry Hughes Center for Agroecology. And uh, I, along with my partners, Allison Prost of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and uh, Bob Cradiville of Extension Service of the University of Maryland College Park and Lynn Hoot of the uh, Maryland Grain Producers Association as one of her hats, we would all like to welcome you today. And uh, without the partnership, I don't think we would have as splendid a group of presenters as well as a splendid group of attendees here today. I'd like to also especially thank my colleagues with whom I work, Nancy Nunn, who added considerably to the content of the agenda, and Linda Dawkins, and also uh, Barbara South, who were at the registration table and made things go smoothly. And then I'd also like to recognize our very active board of directors that we have at the Hughes Center. Um, I don't know if you want to stand or wave your hands, it's your preference, but we have Fran Flanagan and Ed Fry. We have Jeff Horstman, uh, Bobby Hutchinson, who you'll hear a little bit from this morning, Earl Maddox, Andrew McLean, John Valiant, Lucy Wright, and Judge Bo Ernst. Today's program, as you can see, includes just many speakers from different levels and different perspectives and groundings in their organizations. And they're sharing with us what they know at this time with regard to the CHOP tank and applying the best management practices within the watershed. Now, before we begin, I just want to mention several things logistically. If you haven't found them and you need them, the restrooms are over in that area. Our lunch will be in a separate dining hall, which is kind of back that way. Um, our time is very tight, so when you see you need to be in the auditorium, would really appreciate it, because I know it's hard getting yourself motivated to come back in and sit down. But if you would, we would appreciate it. And also wanted to tell you about the note cards you have. Uh, there will be different panels and different speakers. There will probably be questions that occur to you as you listen to them. Please jot those questions down. If you know the speaker in particular whom you'd like to have that question asked of, put their name there, please. Um, and if it's a general question, we'll open it to the entire panel. We've tried to sprinkle question and answer periods after each presentation or if not after groupings of presentations. And at the end of the day, we will go back through those questions that we didn't have the opportunity to ask and receive answers for. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bobby Hutchison, who is the treasurer of our board of directors. He also is co-chair of the Delmarva Land and Litter Project. He and his family are multi-generational and they've been farming, as I know many of you know, in the watershed for several decades. And um, it's really the nugget of interest that Bobby Hutchison dropped on our table and said, you know, a lot's going on in the chop tank and sometimes we hear good things, sometimes we hear bad things. Can we find out why? We're getting different opinions on the health of the chop tanks. So here we are, thanks to you. Thank you, Bobby. Good morning. I'm Bobby Hutchison, a farmer from Talbot County, and I till about 3,400 acres with four partners. Two brothers, a son, 
and a nephew. All but one of our farms are in the Chop Tank watershed. As Sarah stated, this meeting is partially because I asked for it. I asked because I'm confused. And I'm confused about a lot of things, but particularly the condition of the Chop Tank River. I hear that it is the most polluted river on the shore. Then I talk to my farmer friends, and they say they hear that about the river they live on. On September 11th last year, there was an article in the Eastern Star Democrat quoting a river keeper saying, the chop tank's water quality is so bad, if it continues to fail, the fish will just leave our estuary. You will not be able to catch a fish in the chop tank. That same article said there was a large decrease in the benthic organisms, which include clams and aquatic worms, but saw improved scores on total phosphorus and aquatic grasses. Two days later in the Star Democrat, an article stated, while total nitrogen in the mid-bay received a slightly lower score than last year, the score for total phosphorus rose and received an A grade and was among the highest scoring regions, along with the Chop Tank River. In the first article, the river keeper quoted as saying, since we are dominated by agriculture, that is where the pollution source is coming from. I am confused. Is it improving or not? But what I do know is that if, and this is a big if, if it's not improving, then we've missed something. I do know that agriculture has stepped up to do its part. I sat down and listed 41 things that have been adopted in the past 20 years by ag that should improve water quality. This is a list that, that I come up with. Some are mandated, some are better agronomic practices, some are better economic practices. If these are not working, then we've missed something. I have copies of this with me if anybody wants them. Because of the list and the two articles, I asked the Hughes Center for Agroecology and the Maryland Grain Producers to set up a meeting, hoping one of them would. This is a case of be careful what you ask for. And in my case, not thinking big enough. I am pleased that the Ches Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the University of Maryland have joined the effort and it has turned into a similar event to the phosphorus symposium that was put on by Maryland grain producers. Wow, look what happens when great people tackle a project. Thank you to everyone who made this happen, to the presenters and to you for attending. Thank you. My thoughts on what we are missing. Maybe nothing. Maybe we need to give the legacy water time to react to the changes that have already been implemented. And that's what I think is happening myself. Maybe the nutrients in the sediment on the bottom of the river are being disturbed and nutrients released when there's storm events or boat activity, and particularly boat activity on the Tuckahoe River. Maybe it's time to change the way we raise oysters. Maybe we need to raise them on the surface also, step up that project. We don't farm, or any of us, do business the way we did 100 or 150 years ago. Maybe we need to discuss limited access and whether the river and bay is for food production or recreation. A farm field can't be both. People equal pollution. Maybe we need to increase the attention to water quality where it leaves the farm. In fact, this has already started with the in-ditch 
with installation of in-ditch bioreactors. I don't have the answers, but I know that farmers have adopted a lot of water quality practices and are frustrated when we are told that they are not working. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure and really an honor to, to introduce our relatively new dean, Dr. Craig Berruti. On uh, November the 4th, um, not November the 4th, but November of 2015, Dean Beirudi came to the University of Maryland College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And oh my, the energy, the commitment, the dedication, and the deep interest in everything possible that is going on involving agriculture, the Chesapeake Bay, conventional farming, niche farming, you name it, he is deeply in it. And it gives me an honor to introduce you to him today if you haven't met him. Thank you, Dean Beirudi. Sarah, I want to thank you and thank everybody who uh, coordinated this program. Um, I also want to thank the Chesapeake College for providing the venue for this. This is just a beautiful facility and it's central to where we uh, are experiencing some of the issues, certainly around the Chesapeake Bay. I did start in November. Uh, I'm, I'm still in my freshman year. I'm learning more about uh, Maryland and Maryland agriculture all the time. I'll tell you, I hadn't been here probably uh, a couple of weeks when I was contacted by Bobby Hutchinson and Ed Fry and they uh, arranged for me to go up in a little four-seater airplane with Hunter Harris. If you know Hunter, <clears throat> he's an interesting uh, personality. I don't know if Hunter's here or not, but um, Hunter actually was a pilot for Pink Floyd, so I knew that, um, that I was kind of safe going up. And the whole perspective there was really to give me a bird's eye view of the chop tank. And we spent several hours uh, going up and down the chop tank in this little four-seater airplane and getting an appreciation for the lay of the land, um, the land use all along the, the chop tank, which is a very complex watershed and a very complex set of land use as well. But before I got on that airplane, Bobby handed me the same sheet of 41 um, items uh, indicating that this is, this, these are many of the practices that the producers along the chop tank and really along the Chesapeake Bay uh, have implemented in their programs. And it's quite an impressive list of uh, practices. And Bobby, I actually have it on my desk. I have it there so that when I do visit with folks, I pull this thing out and I show it to them and I say, look, I want to show you what the producers are actually doing along the chop tank. They're very frustrated with the results. Um, what can we do? Do we have an explanation for this and so forth? And so uh, one of the purposes today is to really try to get a general feel from the expertise sitting around this room as to what's actually occurring in the chop tank, what's myth, what's reality, what's having a positive impact, what's not necessarily having an impact, or what don't we know, what are some of the holes associated with uh, these practices that we still need to, to gain a deeper understanding with. As I've had the opportunity over the last eight or nine months to, to walk with producers on their fields, oftentimes I ask them if they are frustrated by the, 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 the practices that sometimes are mandated, are required of them in order to uh, um, uh, adjust what's, what's going into the Chesapeake, if this is having a negative impact on their, uh, their ability to produce. More times than not, the feedback that I get is that these practices are, are practices that make them better producers overall. The frustration that they have is that the targets seem to continuously move in, in directions that are very difficult to achieve. And so as they're working towards a particular target, trying to achieve that and accomplish that, that target tends to move and it makes it much more difficult for them to, to continue to, to uh, adopt some of these practices. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us sitting around here, certainly at the University of Maryland, to try to help the producers as much as possible, um, uh, in, certainly uh, maintain economic viability, economic sustainability, but at the same time, 
improve their practices so that they can maintain their ability to produce, and that is uh, in regards to improving and enhancing the Chesapeake Bay. My background is in soils, soil fertility, uh, plant nutrition, and so I'm very interested in learning more about what's happening in terms of uh, agriculture here in Maryland, what we can do in order to be able to help improve and enhance not only the Chesapeake Bay, but also agriculture in general. The University of Maryland is highly committed to this. We have a number of folks here representing Extension, representing the research enterprise and the educational enterprise. Um, we take a lot of pride in the fact that that we're doing a lot of different work in nutrient management and cover crops, in modeling, working in partnership with many of the other organizations who are also focused on the Bay. We want to very much help improve and enhance the overall environment here. And having uh, an opportunity to bring really some of the best minds around in a setting like this today um, allows us, I think, to have that kind of deep dialogue in terms of how we move forward in the future. So I'm very, very excited. Bobby, thanks for generating uh, the idea behind this. I want to thank uh, the various organizations, the Agroecology Center, uh, University of Maryland Extension, uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation um, certainly has, has been a, a tremendously positive partnership associated with this, uh, and, and I look forward to the rest of the day. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, the brand new executive director of the Harry Hughes Agroecology Center. And this is Suzanne Dorsey. And Suzanne comes to us really from North Carolina. Uh, she has a very, very extensive background in, in all things dealing with watershed, in terms of biology, in terms of oceanography. She has a bachelor's degree from uh, Drew University in New Jersey in biology. She has a master's from the University of Maryland in marine estuary science. She also has a PhD in oceanography. She's been working most recently in North Carolina at the Bald Head um, uh, Island Conservancy and also the Smith Island Land Trust. She's been working with a variety of, of individuals that have a, a variety of opinions about um, conservation, about ecology, about the environment, and she has done it very, very well. Uh, she's also been involved in uh, developing funds, private funds, in order to be able to support uh, those two various organizations. And so she's got, a, 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 I think, a, an outstanding background to really lead, be the next leader for the Agroecology Center. We couldn't be more delighted than uh, to have her on board and to really introduce her today. So Suzanne, if you would come up and, and share some thoughts with the group, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Beirudi. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to the staff of the Hughes Center. And um, I'm excited to be here on my second day. So um, bear with me as I, I get to know your names and get to know what you're doing. But uh, I did want to share with you a little bit about how I pr approach conservation and approach um, some of the issues that you're dealing with. And, and my first and foremost goal is to work with communities, um, be that the farming communities or local communities at the state or county level, and understand what is your vision? What do you want your farm to look like and your Chop Tank River? And once we understand that vision, then we can work together to get there. And, and understanding specifically what the needs of the Chop Tank River area are, are um, it's an important, important starting point. Um, I look for practical solutions. And by practical solutions, I mean solutions that are both economically viable and actually fit the question that are, is being asked. So we need both solutions that can be implemented uh, reasonably and also that really answer that question of how do we keep our waterways clean in the Chesapeake Bay. We also need policy to support those, those solutions. And policy also needs to make sense. So policy at a local, state, or federal level needs to be specific, targeted, and it needs to be practical. It can't impose a burden that doesn't allow our farming communities and our local counties to be economically viable. So that, that's important that we balance those different needs. And science, I'm, I'm thrilled to be working closely with the University of Maryland and all of the scientists there to help 
provide solutions that are targeted, that are specific, that are practical, that answer the questions that you need answered. And sometimes acting as a translator between our producers, our communities, and our scientists is an important role for a center like the Hughes Center. Um, so bringing it back up to that vision, the Hughes Center is just an incredible resource for the state of Maryland. I think it ties together all of those parts very neatly. Um, we've got a phenomenal staff, a committed board, as you've already heard, um, strong partnerships with the University of Maryland and a lot of your organizations. I'm thrilled to be able to have the chance to learn more. And a record of solutions and most importantly, um, practical solutions. So I look forward to, co uh, to continuing Governor Hughes' uh, record and legacy of helping Maryland live sustainably, have practical land use approaches. Um, it is a return to home for me. I'm raised in Montgomery County. My family was, uh, has been here for 13 generations, and I'm thrilled to be a part of our Maryland community again and to help you uh, make your vision a reality. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suzanne.